Good morning. Welcome to our early bird webinar in partnership with Merck Sharp and Dumb. My name is Dwayne Schultes. I'm the Managing Director of Vital Transformation, and I'd like to thank you for joining us today. Today we will reflect upon Slovenia's 2008 presidency and its impact on the EU cancer care mandate. Again, thank you for joining us. Now, before we get started, just a couple little things. If you're having issues with your audio quality or your bandwidth, we have supplied several toll-free numbers for you to call in. Just push the little arrow next to the mute button on your control panel. This menu will pop up and you can switch to the phone and dial in. Also, we will be taking questions. We'd very much appreciate having your input. So please push the little Q&A. Uh, this little menu will pop up and you can submit your questions and I will circulate them to the panelists as we move through. So more than 10 years ago, the Slovenian presidency of the Council of the European Union generated new momentum in the continent's fight against cancer. The Council conclusions adopted in 2008 made a strong case for cancer control in the EU and paved the way for several current EU initiatives, including Europe's Beating Cancer Plan. Regardless of the great success putting integrated strategies for cancer control high on the political agenda across Europe, action is required at the local and regional level for successful implementations of measures against the complex group of diseases that we refer to as cancer. What have we learned since Slovenia's cancer focus 13 years ago? Where have cancer control plans worked and why? And where should the council presidencies, EU institutions and member states put their focus? To answer these and several of your questions today, which I'm sure we will have from you, I'm joined by two outstanding experts in our next early bird discussion on cancer control. I'd first like to introduce one of the folks who was pivotal in the 2008 Slovenian Health Conference. That's Tid Albrecht. Tid, uh, thank you very much for joining us. How are you, sir? Thank you very well. And also, uh, always pleased to be joined by Antonella Cardone, the director of the European Cancer Patient Coalition. Good morning, Antonella. How are you? Good morning, everyone. Greetings from Rome. Oh, fine. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so Tit, from, from your perspective, in 2008, Slovenia tried and, and quite successfully focused on cancer and really delivered an EU mandate, which still resonates today. Can you tell us about the council conclusions and how you think they prompted a change in thought? Yes, thank you, Duane. <clears throat> I think it was an important moment. Uh, it was the moment uh, shortly after the biggest enlargement of the EU uh, that we have witnessed uh, in, in its history. And it was an important moment because it was um, essential to bring cancer back to the top of the EU agenda. Uh, I think two key elements were uh, decisive in that moment. One was to um, make widespread use of the national cancer control programs, which we uh, later launched through uh, EU's or European Commission's recommendation to the member states, and which was enacted. And the second one <clears throat> was to build on a partnership, wide partnership, which was later called European Partnership for Action Against Cancer. I think those two elements were essential in that particular moment and in the uh, years to follow. And uh, Antonella, from your perspective, how do you see those 2008 cancer conclusions impacting and advancing cancer control in Europe from your perspective at the European Cancer Patient Coalition? Uh, well, as you said that when in uh, 2008, the Slovenian presidency of the Council of, Europe of the European Union uh, generated a momentum in the uh, fight uh, against uh, cancer uh, and uh, paved the way for new initiatives uh, like uh, the recent uh, Europe's uh, Beating Cancer Plan. Uh, the Council adopted uh, several conclusions on reducing the burden of cancer, uh, stressing the existing substantial inequalities uh, in uh, uh, cancer incidence, uh, mortality, prevalence, uh, and survival within and uh, between member states. And uh, acknowledged uh, in these conclusions that one third of all cancer cases can be prevented, emphasizing that uh, uh, prevention is and remains uh, the most effective uh, long-term strategy to reduce uh, uh, the uh, increasing cancer burden. Uh, furthermore, it uh, highlighted uh, that uh, cancer treatment and cancer care should be multidisciplinary, 
including oncological surgery, uh, medical oncology, radiotherapy, chemotherapy, but also psychosocial support and rehabilitation and palliative care. So among uh, many other aspects uh, that could be cited here, there is uh, no doubt that it was an important milestone to move uh, uh, cancer care forward uh, across Europe. That's great, thank you. Now, Tip, from your perspective, I'd like to discuss sort of the power dynamics of Europe and how this works from a decision-making standpoint. What does the EU have as a mandate on cancer care and how does that relate to the council conclusions and what do the member states do? How much, where do the responsibilities lie? Yes, thank you for this question. Uh, of course, uh, there was a moment, there was an important moment in between our presidency and the current situation and that is the Lisbon Treaty. The Lisbon Treaty of course um, gave a little bit more power to the European Commission in that sense. Uh, it became more of a government type of institution. In any case, the mandate in the fields that uh, Antonella underlined, especially in the public health aspects and in the, <clears throat> in the prevention aspects of, of cancer is essential. Uh, it, European Union can always take the lead on these issues. Partly it's a regulatory framework. Uh, it refers to the, to the area of controlling the use of tobacco and alcohol. Uh, especially the latter is one where much uh, needs to be uh, fulfilled in the next years, hopefully. Uh, but it is also the other side of the regulatory matters where we are particularly concerned. This is um, in social policies, uh, impacting the decisions of the member states in reducing the social inequalities within the European Union, but also in controlling uh, some governance aspects such as uh, quality assurance, uh, which is of particular importance both in um, uh, screening programs as well as, as in care as such. Uh, council conclusions are now, of course, a joint um, process where, of course, the presidency doesn't have such a big role as it had in 2008, but nevertheless, it points to the, um, to the desired um, direction. Of course, this year is made easier because of the existence of the Europe's Beating Cancer Plan. Uh, so you have an overarching document you can nest within this document issues that you want to specifically put forward. So Antonella, from your perspective, then where do and where should Europe's role on cancer begin and where do the member states begin? Where's your, what's your perspective on this? Uh, well, the European Union uh, um, has uh, the, <laughs> The, the power uh, to uh, coordinate and give directions uh, to member states. So um, uh, has the capacity and uh, should uh, lead uh, the fight uh, to reduce uh, the, the burden on cancer. Uh, disparity should uh, be reduced uh, as well because all European citizens uh, should be able to be treated equally no matter where they were born or live in Europe. And so we are uh, pleased to see that uh, the fight against cancer remains a top priority for the European Commission, despite uh, the unprecedented uh, reach and uh, proportion of the coronavirus self crisis. So we applaud also the comprehensiveness of the plan uh, that aims to tackle the entire disease pathways uh, from cancer prevention and early detection to treatment and survivorship. Moreover, we welcome that the plan addresses the debilitating cancer complications and comorbidities that have uh, impact on the quality of life of cancer patients and are in many cases uh, fatal and still uh, too often neglected in policy and research. Uh, so in brief, uh, Europe can and should play a key role to reduce inequalities across and within member states uh, across the entire uh, cancer care journey. Uh, and uh, uh, we believe uh, that uh, um, uh, uh, Europe has uh, uh, the, the power to influence uh, member states, motivating them and uh, uh, pushing them, uh, as uh, uh, Tit said, uh, through a legal, uh, frame, uh, um, a legal framework. 
So you think the framework is more than just budget. You think there are other things they can do regulatorily as well. Yes, definitely. Uh, I mean, a budget helps uh, because, of <laughs> course, budget is a, in, in, is a, is a good motivation and uh, an, an incentive. Uh, but uh, there are also, you know, other aspects uh, uh, such as uh, um, like uh, uh, the cross-border health directive or uh, um, uh, the, uh, the possibility, I mean, I mean, our hope to have a European uh, uh, HTA process. There are, you know, some um, uh, other uh, regulatory uh, aspects uh, through the directives uh, that uh, the European Commission can uh, influence uh, uh, member states in uh, implementing uh, health issues, uh, not uh, uh, only uh, social uh, aspects. Thank you. Now, Ted, from your perspective, you set up and you were certainly personally part of establishing the criteria in 2008. How have those mechanisms and how have those recommendations changed over the last 13 years? How do you see the vision in 2008 being applied now today? Is there uniformity or has there been drift? How, how does that work practically? Um, I, I would say that, of course, we are moving from a more general framework, which was set up, uh, laid out by the National Cancer Control Programs, let's say requirement or recommendation. And now we are moving to the specifics uh, now in the Europe's beating cancer plan called flagships, uh, which go into the precise areas where there is expected action. Uh, of course, Europe has two challenges, uh, which uh, sometimes when we have or when we hear these simple comparisons with the US, for example, um, do not work the same way. Of course, the, uh, the US has the National Cancer Institute, which is, of course, a sort of a central, of course, federal, but central institution. Europe doesn't have one. So there is more need to coordinate uh, the particular policies. Nevertheless, it is encouraging that um, the European Union decided to put the mandate for certain aspects of uh, the mechanisms which are needed into the hands of the uh, newly established cancer uh, knowledge center, which will be a part of the joint research center. Uh, this brings together on the one hand, researchers, on the other hand, uh, decision makers. This is a, an important step in my, in my opinion. And of course, uh, contrary to 2008, just as an anecdote, in 2008, if you mentioned any kind of overarching framework uh, that would uh, almost infringe on uh, national sovereignty, uh, you would hear very strong reactions. I still remember that from policy dialogues uh, that we carried out in 2007. Um, and now it's, the, it's just the opposite. There is desire that we do have something that uh, leads the way and that shows how uh, certain issues need to be regulated also at the level of the uh, European Union. Do you think it was because uh, you had some pushback because Slovenia was small? Certainly the French presidencies have been more than willing to establish agendas. I, do you, what, what do you think about that? Uh, no, I, I, think, I think we were in an advantageous position because we were a new member state. We were a small member state. Uh, and so it was easier in a way, you know, because there, there were no old um, either expectations or let's say, right. points that could be disputed. And uh, France, in any case, in cancer policy, of course, is, is uh, one of the countries that many others were looking up to. And I can give you a practical example, which was very surprising to me. In 2011, I witnessed the launch of the first Maltese uh, National Cancer Control Program, uh, and Malta as being the former colony of, of the UK, uh, you would expect them to link to the, the uh, 
to the England's or UK cancer plan, but no, they actually looked up to France and they got assistance by the by Inca, by the French National Cancer Institute, which helped them in establishing the first national cancer control program, which was excellent. And I think that these collaborations show the way how uh, you you could you can have very productive partnerships in in your developing. That's great. Thank you, Ted. Now, Antonella, from your perspective, I know that one of the things that the European Cancer Patient Coalition is heavily involved in is this dashboard, sort of addressing some of the issues that Tit was just talking about, about unifying the processes and things, sort of doing this more collectively. Can you just describe that process and where you're at with that? Uh, well, we have uh, started with uh, the, the concept of a dashboard uh, uh, right at the beginning when the, the, the Europe's Beating Cancer Plan was uh, uh, at its very early stage of uh, thinking uh, uh, among the European Com Commission people. And uh, so we, we already uh, had uh, this, um, so we are working on the dashboard uh, together with uh, uh, FPA and uh, the European Cancer Organization. Uh, and um, uh, we believe uh, that uh, uh, the, uh, I mean, the, the cancer plan is a good uh, tool, uh, but of course uh, it's a good and nice piece of paper uh, as of today. So we do hope uh, that uh, uh, the implementation will be done properly. And we believe uh, that uh, one uh, good way to make sure that uh, the implementation is, is done properly is to set up uh, from the very beginning a dashboard uh, with uh, a, a solid and uh, multidisciplinary uh, governance uh, structure. So we, do we, we believe uh, that all the main stakeholders uh, should feel uh, ownership of this uh, dashboard. And the, the dashboard, uh, of course, uh, it is uh, not overlapping uh, with uh, the, the concept of uh, the inequalities registry that uh, the European Commission uh, has already um, uh, envisaged uh, into the plan, uh, but it is uh, complementary to that. And uh, we believe uh, that uh, setting up uh, clear targets uh, and um, uh, uh, and uh, clear uh, uh, um, uh, uh, responsibilities uh, for reaching these targets uh, will motivate uh, uh, member states and will motivate uh, all the, uh, the the people responsible for the implementation of the plan to uh, to make an extra effort uh, for that. And um, the 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 idea is uh, to uh, monitor success uh, throughout the implementation from the very beginning. Uh, and uh, we 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 believe uh, that uh, uh, it's uh, um, it's it's uh, an, an excellent uh, tool to, to to support the implementation of the plan. Now, Tip, you were part of the parcel to developing a lot of these benchmarking activities. Are you glad to see this sort of thing developing now? Of course, it's <laughs> uh, it's exciting to to see uh, uh, so many issues materialize. Of course. Um, now the main challenge is, and you have uh, already challenged us with uh, partly with this topic, uh, the key is implementation. A good implementation plan, a good implementation strategy to now uh, really work together with the member states. Uh, it's always good to have a top level uh, political consensus on issues. Uh, and uh, now we have that as Antonella described very uh, nicely. Uh, but now, of course, the main challenge is to transpose uh, all these uh, nice um, proposals and recommendations into national policies. Because, of course, we cannot <laughs> escape from this transposition. And we need to do that. It's very nice to say, well, yes, we, we will set up a registry on uh, socioeconomic inequalities in, ca uh, in cancer. And, uh, but of course, investments need to be made in member states. How they will manage, how they will uh, uh, decide is of course their authority, their competency. But nevertheless, uh, I'm not uh, worried about that. I'm sure that cancer is such a topic that is so, sort of unifying. And I think that politically speaking, for the European Union, in view of um, 
even before Corona, uh, in view of Brexit, uh, cancer was a nice um, uh, weaving ground uh, to interlace uh, the different uh, interests around the topic, which is not disputable. It is a topic where people easily agree because it's a big public health and health policy challenge and problem. Yes, and obviously that's in five, 10 years, it's going to be the largest killer for um, elderly in Europe. So yes, demographically, it's moving into the number one spot in overtaking cardiovascular disease. We do have several questions here. We have about 10 minutes left. I'd like to get to some of our audience questions. Thank you for contributing. If you'd like to throw more into the pot, please do. So um, Liddy Mayus has written, what could be the role of Europe in solving the issues of patient level data collection for registry based treatment assessments? So should this be done at the member state or at the European level? Antonella, what do you think? We're at registry work from patient level data. Obviously, this is a hot topic. How should we do that? Uh, well, uh, this is another uh... Uh, one million yeah. dollar question, but of course, uh, uh, might even be a billion dollar question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the, the thing is uh, that uh, what uh, um, so first of all, it is very important uh, for uh, for uh, for us uh, for cancer patients uh, to make sure that uh, relevant data are collected and are shared properly. So we do not have any problem with the, the um, uh, uh, with sharing our data uh, uh, if uh, uh, they are uh, uh, if we know clearly from the beginning what uh, this data will be for and uh, how they will be used and uh, uh, how they, the information will return to us. So having said that, uh, um, uh, at European level, it is important. Uh, so the, the GDPR is an important uh, uh, instrument and uh, we uh, understand the, the philosophy behind it, uh, which is uh, to uh, protect, uh, first of all, um, the, the patients and the, the data from the patient. But then on the other side, it is important uh, that uh, uh, it doesn't uh, become a burden and an obstacle to share uh, data, mainly when it comes to registries, uh, because I mean, we have been uh, uh, involved in uh, uh, several projects. Uh, the, the latest one is the uh, EPAC, uh, on which uh, Tit, I'm sure, will, uh, will complement uh, my, <laughs> my, um, uh, my view, uh, is that uh, 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 as uh, things are now, uh, too often the, the data are blocked and the, the registries cannot uh, be optimized as they should. And uh, to, to us, uh, this is uh, um, uh, unconceivable. We have to find uh, ways uh, to overcome uh, these obstacles. Uh, now, how? <laughs> I think uh, that uh, sometimes uh, there are uh, issues uh, uh, with uh, the infrastructure of data and uh, the uh, communication. I mean, uh, uh, like each institution believes uh, that uh, they, they, they own the data and they do not want to share the data. And too often they find the GDPR is a pretext not to share the data. So, <laughs> Tit, I hope you can... <laughs> Yeah. Uh, yeah, sure, Tit, from your perspective yeah. then, do you see GDPR as an impediment and how are you managing patient data? Um, Antonella will remember that, of course, when GDPR was being prepared, we were very worried <laughs> at first uh, because the proposals uh, of the parliamentarians and the broader political spectrum uh, were very concerning uh, in terms of uh, limiting even research-based in access to, to important clinical data. I think we are in a different position now, nevertheless. I, I agree that GDPR is often an excuse, but I think that in our project, in the Joint Action IPAC, Innovative Partnership for Action Against Cancer, we have now designed a way of amending the, the data on socioeconomic determinants, uh, the, the data set, uh, which will enable uh, the national registries to, to work together uh, in um, supplying more important information, especially for the survivors uh, and to identify the main survivorship challenges, because this is now becoming one of the big issues, as uh, I'm sure 
Antonella knows more than uh, well. Uh, we have improved survival, which we are happy about, but of course now we are facing different new challenges. Many of our um, citizens, uh, former patients, are now faced with different challenges. We have to support this with data and with analysis. It's not only about care, it's also about uh, continued monitoring. And that's why we need registries. And I think that the overarching uh, instrument that the European Union developed in terms of supporting the European network of cancer registries in uh, JRC and uh, establishing the European Cancer Information System are two very important steps in that process. Thank you. We have a question here from Mark Dooms. Thank you, Mark. Will rare cancers more clearly be mentioned in the revision of the EU orphan drug regulation? It's not really well, it's a proposal right now. Um, do we need to alter the way we're looking at orphan cancers, uh, I guess? Antonella, what's your perspective on the EU proposal that came out regarding orphan drugs, which I mean, it's a year late, but it finally arrived. What, what's your opinion on it? Uh, well, uh, we we uh, we dream uh, to have uh, the uh, the uh, to have it uh, embedding uh, to have the um, the regulation in, embedding also uh, um, uh, orphan uh, cancers. Uh, of course, there is uh, uh, much more that uh, needs to be done. We are not uh, uh, satisfied uh, with, um, uh, with the document as it is now. So we are uh, pushing, we are working to make sure that uh, uh, it will embed also the uh, orphan cancers. But at the moment, uh, we, uh, we are not 100% satisfied. And I, I mean, I, I don't know if uh, it will, uh, I don't know it yet if it will uh, uh, include uh, uh, orphan cancers as well. So, yeah, but obviously it's something you're working on. Okay, thank you, Mark, for your yes, question. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. We, we have a question here from Demir Marek, and this is specifically for you, Tit. What is the secret in the Slovenian CRC screening program implementation? What have you done there? Uh, <laughs> Uh, yes, I can, I can say that when we set off, uh, our response rates were not great, and we were looking for, um, for a better strategy. One of the things that um, we learned from was something that um, some of my um, colleagues from social sciences would call doctors too often think they know all fields best. <laughs> and even though I'm a doctor, I have to agree to that. And the missing link was the communication strategy. Uh, we employed a communication strategist who built a totally different communications approach. And it became more focused on, on an average citizen, if I may call uh, a person that, the, the, the citizen who has his or her own fears uh, in, in face of this uh, screening program. And now it has become uh, a self-perpetuating mechanism that led us to these 65% response rate, which is of course um, regionally is reached in some, uh, in some regions in the European Union, because for many, we are basically a region, not a state uh, in terms of size. Uh, but uh, we are really proud of that. And we have saved hundreds of lives. So well, our message is do dedicate time and energy to the right communication strategy. And secondly, to your niche populations, whether they are migrants, whether they are uh, people who have health literacy challenges, uh, you have to, if you want to reach these high percentages, you have to deal with that as well. It's not just throwing the message into the, into the population. Thank you, Ted. Well, we're almost out of time, ladies and gentlemen. So I'm going to ask Antonella to just one final question. If you could try to limit yourself to 15 seconds, <laughs> <laughs> Antonella. What do you expect from the Slovenian Council presidency in relation to cancer care? Well, we um, 
uh, as a, a Slovenian uh, uh, prioritized on uh, cancer uh, as a public health issues uh, uh, during the, the, the previous presidency 13 years ago, uh, we uh, expect uh, that uh, cancer will remain a priority and uh, that um, uh, as uh, the cancer plan will be on its way uh, for the implementation, we hope uh, that uh, this uh, dashboard will be set up. So if uh, we will not have yet uh, um, uh, uh, tangible outcomes of the plan of the Europe's Beating Cancer Plan, at least uh, we will see the, the dashboard uh, uh, in place uh, and uh, uh, well, um, well, well set up, well established. Thank you. Tit, the last word to you, 15 seconds. What do we expect from your presidency coming up? Uh, we expect the reconfirmation of the policies set laid out in 2008. I have the pleasure of uh, informing everyone also in Antonella that we uh, reached the point where I will be speaking at the main uh, conference uh, that Slovenia holds in July on the topic of partnerships and cancer. And this is the biggest legacy of, of the whole process, uh, co collaboration among uh, EU member states and other countries uh, to improve cancer care and cancer control in Europe. Thank you, Tit. Pleasure meeting you. It's the first time we've worked together. Antonella, always a pleasure. And for our audience, thank you very much. With that, this breakfast briefing, our early bird is closed. Have a good day. Bye-bye, everybody.